Hi, my name is Sahil Parikh, and uh, along with Dr. Jackson T. Wright, Jr., we will be presenting today on contemporary management strategies for resistant hypertension. Welcome to the Department of Medicine, Grand Realms. Today I have the privilege of introducing our speakers, Dr. Jackson Wright and Dr. Sahil Parikh. Dr. Jackson Wright graduated from Ohio Wesleyan University with a Bachelor's of Arts and received both his MD and PhD in Pharmacology from the University of Pittsburgh. He completed his internal medicine internship and residency at the University of Michigan. Dr. Wright is currently a tenured professor of medicine, program director of the William T. Doms Clinical Research Unit, and director of the Clinical Hypertension Program at Case Western Reserve University. His research accomplishments include leadership involvement in major clinical outcome trials that span the last two decades, which include the All Hat Trial. Dr. Wright has published extensively and serves on many national and international advisory panels. Dr. Sahil Pare graduated from the Harvard University with a Bachelor's of Arts in Biomedical Sciences and Engineering and received his MD from John Hopkins University. He completed his internal medicine residency and chief residency at Massachusetts General Hospital, his cardiovascular medicine and interventional cardiology fellowships at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and vascular medicine and intervention fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital. In 2009, Dr. Preet joined Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine as assistant professor and serves as a faculty interventional cardiologist. In addition to his clinical responsibilities, he is director of the Experimental Interventional Cardiology Laboratory of the Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute and an investigator in the Case Center for Research and Innovation. Dr. Preek is a nationally recognized speaker and has received teaching awards in addition to his active research and numerous publications in basic and clinical cardiovascular medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Preek and Dr. Wright. Thank you, Dr. Angelina. It's a pleasure to, uh, to again present at Grand Rounds, and it's certainly a pleasure to present on this topic. Uh, uh, we are, and this has been a, uh, an extreme pleasure to, in fact, collaborate with Dr. Parikh uh, on this uh, project that you will hear about shortly. Um, oops. My first slide shows the, the uh, uh, disclosures. Uh, I am, uh, uh, this trial that will be discussed is sponsored by Medtronic, and so that uh, my uh, uh, conflicts are shown there. I do serve as consultant as, uh, for Medtronic also. My role is to, on this program, is to discuss the medical therapy of uh, resistant hypertension. Um, uh, Dr. Parikh will then uh, uh, discuss the trial, uh, the simplicity trial, uh, which uh, represents, uh, and I've been doing this for, uh, I usually say a little over two years, but uh, um, closer to about three decades now, and for the first time I think we're actually talking about a potential cure for, for hypertension for the first time uh, in, in my experience. When we talk about resistant hypertension, uh, definition is uh, a patient who is uncontrolled, uh, whose blood pressure cannot be controlled on uh, at least three medications. Uh, that's one definition. In addition, uh, the new uh, definition also indicates that any patient who requires uh, four or more medications in order to achieve control is also uh, considered resistant. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, uh, resistant hypertension. And I'll show you data. It's not, this is not a rare dis, uh, disorder. When you, when you uh, talk about resistant hypertension, then you certainly have to uh, rule out uh, pseudo-hypertension, as shown here, um, a poor measurement technique, uh, which, I mean, blood pressure is one of the most common um, uh, measurements we do uh, within the uh, uh, 
uh, primary care internal medicine uh, offices, but it's also uh, one in which there is the probably the worst level of standardization. Uh, medication adherence, uh, and this is both uh, from the, uh, on the, on the uh, case of the patient as well as providers in terms of uh, titrating uh, medication, uh, so that uh, that can be a cause of uh, uncontrolled uh, blood pressure. And the issue of white coat hypertension, uh, which is, uh, is also uh, not rare. When we talk about, uh, uh, when, you, when you see a patient with resistant hypertension, you generally find with true resistant hypertension, uh, then uh, they will typically have a, a one or more of these characteristics. So generally be older in age, particularly uh, when we talk about uh, resistant systolic hy hypertension. Uh, they would generally have higher baseline blood pressures. Obviously, if you have more severe hypertension, it's going to require uh, more th uh, therapy in order to treat it. Uh, patients who are obese, uh, obesity is a common cause of, of resistant hypertension, not only from the uh, standpoint of requiring more medication uh, for a larger body size, also measurement, uh, it, it increases measurement variability. Salt intake uh, is, uh, you, know, you can overwhelm uh, the uh, uh, antihypertensive medications uh, with excessive salt intake. Obviously patients with CKD, uh, diabetes, uh, will, uh, those participants usually have a wider pulse pressure, uh, more difficult to control systolic blood pressure. Uh, patients with any form of carbon organ damage obviously have more severe hypertension and therefore would be higher, uh, more difficult to control. Uh, black race is, uh, uh, pa black patients uh, typically have uh, uh, a more severe uh, hypertension. For some reason female se uh, gender or sex is also uh, a, uh, uh, it's more common, uh, there are more re uh, female resistant hypertensives uh, than uh, male and also uh, uh, residents within the uh, southeastern United States probably can do the diet. When we talk about uh, uh, the uh, resist resistant hypertension, it used to be that uh, it was considered rare. Uh, but this prevalence has increased over, over time uh, uh, with the aging of the population uh, and the continued rise in systolic blood pressure, uh, uh, resistant hypertension becomes more common. The higher rates of obesity uh, have clearly contributed um, and the higher prevalence of diseases uh, that would in fact uh, um, uh, uh, cause uh, as particularly uh, a higher instance of systolic hypertension, diabetes, uh, hyperlipidemia, one of the, the area things that have been also has been observed is the lower doses of, uh, of antihypertensives that have been used. Uh, 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 providers are, are uh, somewhat reluctant to titrate medications to, to their full dose, uh, and especially diuretics. I mean, the use of 12 and 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide equivalent. Most of the patients that we see in our resistant in our uh, hypertension specialty clinic uh, uh, are simply uh, we provide them an adequate dose of diuretic and, 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 and discharge them back to their their, their providers. Uh, you have to use adequate doses. You cannot achieve adequate blood pressure control unless you do adequately diurese the participant and obviously a patient and provider not adherence. To address the issue in terms of the uh, uh, frequency of, uh, of re resistant hypertension, uh, the All-Hat trial uh, was finished about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and at the end of that trial, the All-Hat trial was designed to uh, look at the effect of uh, the uh, uh, four different classes of antihypertensives. The, a diuretic, chlorothaladone, amnotapine, mycinopril, or doxazosin. So it was a trial designed to be a, as close to a monotherapy trial as any. Uh, you can see, this looks at the percent of uh, uh, participants within the all had trial who achieved a blood pressure less than 140 over 90. As you can see, even in this trial where you, patients were selected for their ability to be controlled, potential ability to be controlled by monotherapy, you each had about three, uh, somewhere about 15% of patients who required um, three or more medications 
Now, in order to achieve a blood pressure less than 140 over 90, but still, uh, with all that, even though other medications could be added on, about uh, we're successful in controlling about two thirds of the particip participants of less than 140 over 90, meaning that still a third of the patients uh, could not be controlled uh, to uh, were not controlled to less than 140 over 90, and as I indicate, uh, three to four, uh, 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 about 15 percent of them were already on uh, three or four uh, uh, medications. <coughs> Overall, about 49%, about half the participants, could be controlled on about one to two medications. About 60% were controlled on three or fewer medications, meaning that uh, about 40% of the participants uh, either were not controlled or required um, uh, uh, more medications. And so therefore, even in uh, populations such as that was recruited in all hat, uh, selected for ease of control, about a third of the participants uh, would meet the criteria for resistant hypertension. So that gives you an idea of what to, can be, uh, that, that certainly resistant hypertension is not uh, 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 rare. Causes uh, are uh, impro improper uh, blood pressure uh, uh, measurement technique. Uh, we'll discuss that in a little bit in, in greater detail. We've talked about uh, sodium uh, intake, uh, in inadequate diuretic therapy, uh, inadequate uh, titration of medications. The, uh, there are some drugs, as shown here, that will uh, antagonize the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the antihypertensive effect of medications and also uh, 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 make the blood pressure more difficult to control. Excessive alcohol intake, uh, patients sometimes make the choice between alcohol and, uh, and medications, and uh, sometimes medications don't win out. And obviously, identifiable causes of hypertension. We discussed the fact that uh, um, uh, uh, office measure, blood pressure measurement is uh, sometimes can be problematic. And one of the, you know, it's not uncommon for us to see patients uh, within our clinics who are con uncontrolled. Uh, you measure the blood pressure, and the blood pressure is a lot lower than, than what has uh, been reported uh, in their primary care provider's office. Um, Blood pressure, patients, uh, blood pressure prior to measurement, they need to be seated quietly in the chair for at least five minutes that their blood pressure is to be taken in. Uh, you can, in fact, increase blood pressure. If you measure, uh, if you measure uh, patients by that criteria and then uh, measure them after putting them on the exam table, blood pressure will be somewhere between five to, millimeters, five to 10 millimeters mercury higher. So that uh, one of the uh, more common causes of resistant hypertension is just uh, uh, taking the blood pressure on the exam table rather than taking it in, in, in the chair. So that's something to keep in mind. Obviously, uh, adequate size cuff, 80% around the, the arm. Uh, cuff should go 80% around the, the arm, uh, otherwise it's too small. Uh, two, uh, obviously, the uh, two blood pressure measurements need to be taken uh, and patients uh, should be, um, uh, do need to provide that uh, to, to the information to the patient. Causes of, of hypertension, identifiable causes, uh, the, uh, uh, are shown here on this slide. A couple areas where uh, uh, the checks are potentially uh, treat, uh, with, uh, potentially treatable causes of uh, secondary hypertension. Uh, sleep apnea is the, I think the data is becoming equivocal on, on sleep apnea, whether uh, the treatment of the sleep apnea will actually uh, significantly reduce blood pressure. I mean, we're uh, to the point now where uh, uh, you don't even look at uh, uh, re uh, renal vascular disease I anymore in, in, for renal vascular disease in participants uh, because of the fact that uh, uh, repair of uh, uh, the uh, renal vascular disease um, uh, has uh, not had great success in terms of uh, reducing uh, blood pressure. Um, uh, the others, as shown on, on this slide, are fairly common causes in the, uh, of the secondary hypertension, which we always look for. So that evaluation of resistant hypertension, obviously you confirm the diagnosis 
evaluate for uh, uh, potential non-adherence, um, uh, obviously evaluate for, for uh, treatable secondary causes, uh, which uh, are, are uh, uh, usually, um, in terms of true secondary causes, uh, are uh, relatively uh, rare, and evaluate for potential causes of uh, drug resistance, including uh, uh, the uh, concomitant drugs, uh, uh, dietary non-adherence. Uh, uh, non but the other is that uh, you also see some strange regimens uh, for uh, uh, inpatients who come in with hypertension. Um, if you're going to have uh, patients with, who are diagnosed with, with resistant hypertension, uh, if you, you sh uh, the should be on, uh, these would be the drugs that the patients need, need to be on at this point. Uh, these uh, have them on these three classes of drug, calcium channel blockers, diuretics, RAS inhibitors uh, uh, would be the preferred three drug regimen. Uh, recent data uh, should know that uh, dual RAS uh, therapy uh, provides uh, no, a very little additive uh, blood pressure lowering uh, and also provides very little in terms of the way in, in, in the way of uh, uh, protection. In, out, in, in clinical outcome trials has shown no reduction in clinical outcomes. Add-on therapy, uh, uh, do want to admonish uh, folk about the use of clonidine. Clonidine is, is not a drug that, that should be used in the primary treatment of hypertension. It's a TID drug, one. It adds little to a regimen already containing other sympathetics. Guanfacine is a true once-a-day medication. Uh, uh, so that unlike clonidine, guanfacine, same mechanism of action as clonidine, can be given once a day. It's a true once a day drug. Actually, love reserpine uh, is probably the best tolerated of those up there. Unfortunately, it costs about a dollar, uh, 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 almost a uh, uh, hundred dollars a month now. Uh, reserpine used to be extremely cheap. Uh, Add-on drugs, uh, hydralazine, uh, minoxidil, obviously, uh, ca uh, can be used for add-on. But do want to mention uh, spironolactone. Um, uh, spironolactone is a drug that clearly should be used and can be tried uh, and used effectively in patients with uh, resistant hypertension. This shows 24-hour blood pressure monitoring data uh, showing the add-on of uh, spironolactone uh, to a... Uh, 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 to a, a fairly intensive uh, antihypertensive regimen. Uh, it can be used with relatively low dose, uh, 25, generally 25 to 50 milligrams uh, is sufficient. It, uh, useful to, uh, particularly in, in obese patients, patients with sleep apnea. Uh, the uh, gynecomastia uh, can be seen at uh, higher doses and other anti-androgen effects. Uh, need to uh, monitor for hyperkalemia. Um, Eplerinone is a good substitute, but it, it costs about $100 a month and is contraindicated in patients with CKD. Uh, Amiloride, 5 to 10 milligrams, is, can also be effective uh, if aldosterone antagonists are, are, are not tolerated. And uh, one study out of uh, London, uh, a survey of about 800 patients, uh, showed that about 6 to 8% of black hypertensives uh, will have a uh, 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 haplotype of the uh, endothelial uh, sodium channel uh, that responds very well to, uh, to uh, amylorite. Get into renal, uh, uh, this, uh, this sympathetic nervous system, and the, uh, you know, I'll close with, with, with this as an introduction to uh, what uh, Dr. Parikh will present. Uh, shows that somewhere around the 1930s, uh, actually uh, the uh, 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 sympathectomies uh, uh, were, uh, uh, was uh, shown, was uh, 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 used as therapy for, uh, for uh, severe cases of hypertension. If I were to do the procedure, uh, this is what I would do. <laughs> now, uh, it, 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 this is to show that it, 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 it can be a fairly uh, um, uh, uh, complicated procedure.
procedure. And for that matter, once it's completed, it had a lot of side effects in terms of orthostatic hypotension, uh, GI complaints, particularly diarrhea, um, sexual dysfunction. I mean, it was uh, uh, patients had a very poor uh, lifestyle uh, associated with it. Uh, but in fact, it did work. I mean, this looks like a survival curve. Uh, patients, uh, uh, a normal population, and then looks looks at severe hypertension uh, with uh, patients uh, with uh, uh, added. Uh, uh, severity and significant uh, 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 morbidity uh, associated with the hypertension, uh, increasing severity as the survival curves uh, reduce. Start, look at group three. Uh, uh, patients in this category were in fact uh, uh, randomized uh, to uh, uh, receive either uh, uh, continued medical therapy or surgical uh, sympathectomy, and as you can see, uh, the, the, the treatment was in fact life-saving um, if we could get, find a more tolerable way of presenting it. Uh, data showing that, uh, that you can in fact show increased sympathetic tone in patients with uh, resistant hyper uh, in patients with hypertension as shown here, uh, measuring from uh, the, uh, uh, the afferent sympathetic nerve activity showing uh, that compared to normal tensives, no matter how you classify hypertension, they have a higher rate of, um, of uh, 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 elevated uh, sympathetic activity. And this relates to the fact that, uh, in fact, the sympathetic nervous system uh, not only mediates uh, the causes the kidneys to release renin and angiotensin, cause sodium retention, reduce uh, renal blood flow, but it also feeds back to the brain. And uh, also, uh, the brain interacts with uh, 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 multiple other systems uh, within the, uh, the, uh, uh, the body. And uh, Dr. Parikh uh, will, in fact, show you uh, some of these uh, 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 we'll we'll uh, provide you, uh, show you uh, some of those, th those interactions. I'll turn it over to Dr. Parikh, who will take over from here. Great. See you. Thank you. Thanks, Jackson, very much. Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to collaborate with you on this uh, innovative trial, and I'm uh, happy to be here to represent the Harrington Heart Rescue Institute. Uh, so Jackson has talked briefly about the epidemiology, diagnosis, and medical therapy. And, and uh, for those of you who are, who are residents and fellows, Dr. Wright was the PI for All Hat, which is one of the game-changing trials of the last decade. Uh, so uh, he's being modest uh, in his role in this field. Um, we're going to talk now about uh, catheter-mediated renal sympathetic denervation, which is the subject of the Simplicity Hypertension 3 trial, uh, which Jackson and I are the co-PIs for here at UH. And we'll talk about some of the interesting non-blood pressure related targets uh, of renal denervation and some of the future management options that we, uh, we expect to see in the coming years. Um, just like drug eluting stents have changed interventional cardiology, this technology has the potential to change how we practice interventional cardiology and general medicine in the coming decades. Uh, like Jackson, I'm the site PI for uh, the trial sponsored by Medtronic, and I'm a consultant for both Medtronic and Boston Scientific, uh, who have uh, catheters in this space. So, uh, as Jackson alluded to, the sympathetic nerves uh, arborize or wrap around the renal artery and come uh, down the aortic trunk um, at about the level of T10 to L2. The nerves are in the adventitial aspect of the artery, and you can see the perineural bundles here, uh, and the adventitia of uh, a normal renal artery. With today's techniques, using a conventional uh, guiding catheter uh, and, a, and a modified uh, electrophysiologic ablation catheter, we can actually get from the inside of the artery to the outside by giving a radio frequency pulse of energy at a low level of energy, about one-tenth of what we use for EP ablations, uh, and, and uh, disrupt the nerves on the adventitial surface. Um, and so in order to ablate all of these nerves effectively, one typically would need to make a helical type of uh, pass with your catheter. Uh, and each of these burns takes about two minutes in time um, and is efficiently uh, able to ablate these nerves. And I'll show you some data to support that. In an uh, extensive amount of animal work, uh, this proof of concept uh, demonstrated tremendous reductions in, in uh, renal norepinephrine release. 
So if you take uh, about 150 animals in, in which uh, no denervation was done, uh, you can see that the uh, reference amount of norepinephrine is about 150 picograms per milligram of tissue. After denervation with either catheter or surgical techniques, there's a, a nearly tenfold reduction in the norepinephrine uh, reduction, uh, uh, production rather. And this is uh, emblematic of uh, the interaction of the afferent and efferent sympathetic nervous system in the kidney. When looking at histopathology, uh, one might wonder what happens to the renal artery when you injure it with an ablation catheter. And this Movat penichrome stain uh, at six months after uh, denervation in a swine model. These, this area of green demonstrates uh, medial hyperplasia and thickening uh, with some fibrosis at the site of denervation. But in contradistinction to what we see in, in restenosis with interventions of all types, be it balloon angioplasty or stenting, there is no encroachment upon the, uh, the lumen of the blood vessel. So the amount of injury is not sufficient, we don't think, to cause uh, intimal hyperplasia in most patients. And this is what the nerves uh, on high power magnification look like on the left hand side is what we would consider a normal H and E stain of a perineural uh, bundle uh, of a real sympathetic nerve. And this is what the uh, denervated uh, nerve would look like. There's marked fibrosis uh, and increased cellularity, um, which uh, is uh, suggestive of an active inflammatory process. So uh, as, uh, as ever, the, uh, for those of you who are residents, uh, all this started really with a case report that was published in the New England Journal. Uh, there was a company that had had this idea and had developed a catheter and had done all the preclinical animal work. Um, and then uh, outside of the United States, uh, where the regulatory bodies are somewhat less stringent, they found a patient who did in fact have a se severely resistant hypertension. He's a 59-year-old man, um, and they performed real artery sympathetic denervation using a catheter-based system. And it was submitted as a letter to the editor of the New England Journal in 2009. Uh, and what they showed uh, was dramatic reductions in blood pressure over the course of 12 months in this patient whose baseline was 160 over 100 roughly on, on five agents. Um, they have a myographic image of the motor uh, neuron sympathetic nerve activity where you can see multiple spikes to represent the activity of the sympathetic nervous system which is subsequently blunted over time concordant with the reduction in blood pressure. And so if anything, this is a proof of concept in humans that uh, sympathetic denervation may have uh, an effective uh, therapy uh, for uh, blood, uh, resistant hypertension and blood pressure. So fast forward several years, there's a commercial catheter that's now available for investigational use. Uh, this is the Simplicity uh, catheter. Um, it has a, a handle with a, a slide lock on it that allows you to flex the catheter tip and a, uh, a rotating collar that allows you to rotate the uh, aspect of the catheter in 360 degrees. Uh, the catheter, like most EP uh, catheters, uh, can deliver a output of at least five watts of energy. Um, most EP catheters go up to 50 to 100 watts, uh, incidentally. And the catheter also dynamically monitors temperature and impedance at the uh, level of the, the sensor here at the tip. Uh, the catheter, once activated, shuts off automatically after two minutes or if there's any change in heat uh, or impedance. And so, uh, in order to make this simple, uh, I, because I can't show you any clinical subjects since it's the subject of a clinical trial, here's a cartoon uh, that demonstrates uh, how this is done. So uh, take, for example, uh, your animated human. Um, the renal uh, sympathetic uh, nervous system uh, comes down the aortic trunk and arborizes around the renal artery. Uh, we can engage the renal artery with a, with a coronary type guiding catheter and advance carefully our, our ablation catheter into the renal artery. We pull on the slide lock and the catheter deflects and abuts the artery and we can deliver a pulse of energy. We then withdraw the catheter very slowly and carefully under fluoroscopic guidance, rotate the collar and deliver another burst of energy. And again, each of these pulses lasts for about two minutes each. Um, it is painful, so patients are heavily sedated uh, with uh, generally Versed and fentanyl, uh, and they're uh, still awake and conscious as they would be with most catheter-based procedures. Following bilateral denervation, theoretically, uh, one would expect that you've caused uh, effective denervation of both kidneys uh, and the subsequent uh, physiologic uh, sequelae, which we'll talk about.
So it looks easy, and in fact, compared to many of the catheter-based procedures that we do in the cath lab, this is one of the most easy, if not boring, procedures that we do. Uh, but it has the potential to have a huge impact for our patients. So uh, leveraging this technology, the company that developed it initially was a small startup in, in Minnesota, was bought by their neighbor Medtronic, um, and uh, they've embarked upon an extensive clinical trial program both outside of the United States and now here in the U.S. Um, First in Man was, uh, was published as a case report, as I mentioned to you earlier, and there's been a series of pilot studies uh, followed by a more randomized control trial called Simplicity Hypertension True, which uh, has resulted in CE mark approval for this technology in Europe. Um, here in the U.S., we have Simplicity HTN3, which uh, Jackson and I are participating in, along with uh, those of you here at UH uh, who are interested in the area. And there's a bunch of sub-studies, including one in heart failure that our own Dr. Fang uh, is uh, leading. So many of us uh, really were, were skeptical that this therapy would have any kind of long-lasting benefit. But it turns out in the first group of patients in a registry-type format who were treated with bilateral denervation, we now have 36 months data to support that they have a reduction of their blood pressure of about 30 over 15. So systolic blood pressure reductions of over 30 points, diastolic pressure reductions of over 15 points. Again, the N is small, out to 36 months, but there appears to be a sustained reduction in uh, blood pressure response over time. In the randomized trial where they actually took patients and randomized them to a sham procedure versus the uh, control uh, to the actual therapy, uh, there was a similar reduction at six months, 30 over 12, roughly, where the control had essentially no change in blood pressure over that time. Uh, and in that trial, those patients who were randomized to control uh, were then offered the ability to cross over to the therapy arm if they still met the inclusion criteria for the trial. And you see here uh, in orange, these are the patients who got the therapy initially. Blood pressure mean was 178 systolic, down to the 140s to 150s, sustained out now to 24 months. Again, recapitulating the data from Simplicity HTN1. Those patients in the crossover arm had a very similar trend, uh, a 30-point reduction roughly in blood pressure, which was interestingly continuing to drop over the ensuing 24 months. And so we now have two sets of data in a very rigorously uh, controlled fashion uh, that show sustained benefit out to over two years with a single therapy um, with uh, renal denervation. You know, drilling down on this somewhat uh, further, you can see that most of the uh, impact is seen at, at within the first six months, uh, and in, in some studies you see even further reduction beyond six months, uh, and that trend uh, is being further investigated currently. It's also important to note that even if you define a response as an improvement of 10 millimeters mercury in their blood pressure, only about 80% of patients have a reduction of their blood pressure. So that means one-fifth of patients don't get any significant reduction, and there's a number of reasons why that may be, but most likely it's technical. We think uh, when you're doing focal ablations in multiple locations, if you don't ablate the entire nervous uh, innervation of the kidney, we may not affect the, uh, the desired goal. What is interesting, though, is that there is, uh, in both curves, the yellow and red, you see whether you define a reduction as 10 millimeters or 20 millimeters of mercury, there seems to be an improved response over time. Now, the error bars are not shown on here because the numbers are relatively small, but we, we do believe that um, you may see a sustained response and even a delayed response in some patients for a variety of reasons, which are still under investigation. Uh, and again, other measures of adrenergic tone, including heart rate at rest, um, have been shown to improve over time after this procedure. Uh, the complex interaction between the sympathetic nervous system and the myocardium, uh, of course, is mediated via the brain, uh, but there remains a lot of speculation as to whether this is, in fact, an epiphenomenon or, in fact, a direct res response to the denervation of the, of the kidney. The other thing of interest to your patients is that there's a significant percentage of patients who have a reduction in their blood pressure, but the majority of patients are in fact taking about the same number of blood pressure agents, and, and over time they generally have a reduction of their uh, number of blood pressure agents. Um, so what we tell our patients is that we don't expect that you're going to drop the number of meds you're taking necessarily, uh, but we do expect that you'll come under control, whereas you were previously uncontrolled. Um, it remains unclear to me uh, how many medicines uh, we would 
be able to drop on a patient who doesn't have resistant hypertension, and that's under active investigation. Another concern, obviously, would be the, the role of renal function in these patients. Uh, again, from simplicity hypertension 2, now where we have 12 months out on renal function, um, it appears that the GFR uh, in both the standard uh, patient, the treatment arm, and in the crossover arm remains relatively constant over time. And again, these patients were selected for having a normal or quote-unquote normal renal function at, at the uh, inclusion for the trial. But there is no decrement necessarily that's statistically significant that demonstrates a harm uh, in terms of renal function over this short duration follow-up. Other points of uh, interest, I think, would be what happens in terms of other cardiovascular events. One would expect that in this enriched population, the number of uh, cerebrovascular and myocardial events would be enriched. And in fact, there hasn't been in, uh, in this trial a huge uh, surge of uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, hypertensive uh, emergencies due to non-adherence are about the same in both groups, and we would expect that to be obviously unchanged because the number of blood pressure medications isn't dropped by three or four meds. Um, we also see TIA uh, and frank stroke um, and coronary interventions uh, occurring at, at what we, we would expect uh, at the expected rate. Um, but the numbers are small uh, at this time. What we would expect, though, is that patients over the long term who are better controlled would have a lower event rate, although no trials yet have shown an outcome difference uh, in these patients, and that's clearly an area of need uh, before we can really uh, convene uh, our consensus about the therapy. Uh, again, and over time, you see a similar trend. Interestingly, we talked about orthostasis with sympathectomy in the surgical population. There's really only been one uh, reported event of, of a hypotension requiring hospitalization with these patients, and that's another area that's curious. Compared to the surgical patient, we have a much lower incidence of episodic hypotension that's symptomatic, uh, apparently, with this technique. For those of us that uh, do renal angiography, this is an allegory that the folks with the trial uh, have not seen too many adverse events because they're rigorously controlling who's included in the, in the uh, clinical trial. Uh, in Europe, now that this is CE mark approved, the, the, the therapy is going wild. There's thousands of patients that have been treated uh, with CE mark approval for the technique. Uh, and there is a case report now of a patient having renal injury. Shown above is the initial denervation uh, procedure done uh, in August of 2011. Um, if you look quite carefully at the paper, there, there is some renal artery atherosclerosis. Uh, at the os of the renal artery, which is where we typically see it. And, and about uh, a year later, or six months later, the patient came back with, re uh, re with new uh, or recurrent resistant hypertension and in fact had a significant translational gradient of about 45 millimeters of mercury because of a new stenosis in the renal artery. Now whether this was a complication of the denervation procedure uh, or progression of native atherosclerosis is not clear. Uh, but clearly it's an allegory that we need to be careful um, how we touch these delicate arteries with these catheters, which are relatively blunt instruments. So that brings me to uh, the Simplicity HTM3 trial, which uh, uh, we're proud to have here at, at University Hospitals. The, it's a multi-center trial that now has 90 sites uh, throughout the United States. It's, it's a prospective, randomized, uh, blinded uh, trial that's core lab controlled. Um, it's in, in designed to enroll 530 patients. We're approaching uh, two-thirds or three-quarters enrollment in the trial currently um, and hope to have the enrollment completed this uh, summer. Um, the treatment group, two-thirds will receive the renal denervation procedure uh, after they qualify for the trial. We'll talk about that in a moment. And about a third will get a control procedure, which is just the renal angiogram, and during which everybody wears blindfolds except for the operators, of course, uh, and uh, we play loud music into their headphones and give them lots of sedation. So apart from the team in the room, both the follow-up physicians and the patient are blinded to which group they're in, and they're followed very closely subsequently. The primary outcome measure, interestingly, for a cardiovascular trial is just really the blood pressure in the office comparing baseline to six-month data, and we'll talk about that some at the end. Uh, and there's also a safety endpoint. Um, here, the inclusion criteria includes to stop pressures greater than 160 as measured uh, in Dr. Wright's uh, slides. Uh, for those of us that see patients at a, at a speedy clip, um, I think all we would ever get to do is measure blood pressure if that's how we measured our blood pressures in the office. 
but nevertheless for the trial, we, we take pains to, to pick, put people's feet on the floor, let them rest for five minutes, and then measure the pressure three times in each arm. Uh, we then make sure that they're on a full tolerated doses of three or more antihypertensives. Uh, as Dr. Wright uh, alluded to, uh, diuretic is mandatory, uh, and then renal angiotensin uh, aldosterone uh, agon antagonism is, is expected, along with calcium channel blockers. We also lock the patients into their planned medication strategy for six months, so we want to ensure that they're on an optimal regimen. And uh, age 18 to 80 is included for the trial. The median uh, age is in the 60s uh, nationally. The way this works is if, if a patient is referred to us, um, they're seen for their index visit called SV1, uh, their blood pressures are, met, are, are measured and confirmed, and their medication regimen is confirmed. Uh, we make sure that they've been on their meds for at least two weeks in a stable fashion, and then we send them home and make them write down every time they take their blood pressure medicines. And you would be amazed at the number of patient, patients who automatically come under control when they know that we're watching. Uh, and many of the patients fall out between uh, SV1 and 2 when they come back for confirmatory screening two weeks subsequently. Um, at that point, we again confirm that their blood pressures are in range for the trial, and we get laboratory work that ensures that their renal function is adequate, and that's defined as an EGFR greater than 45 mils per minute. We subsequently do a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. I'm remiss, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about this later, but Dr. Wright and the hypertension clinic do offer that uh, therapy or that diagnostic test for those of you that are looking to figure out how hypertensive really are my patients at home. The, essentially what it amounts to is a, is a blood pressure reading every 30 minutes for 24 hours, after which that data is brought back to us and processed. And if the ABPM demonstrates a systolic pressure mean of 135 or greater, the patient is then qualified for the trial if all other factors are, are okay. They then get referred for renal angiography, which we perform in the cath lab, uh, at which point if the renal angiogram demonstrates that there's no obstructive atherosclerosis, the patient can be randomized, as we described previously. Once the randomization occurs, patients are seen in, in serial follow-up one, three, and six months following the procedure. Um, patients in the treatment arm and control arm have the same follow-up strategy. At six months' time, we uh, get our primary endpoint of systolic blood pressure reduction in the office, and another ambulatory blood pressure monitor and uh, uh, medication confirmation is, is performed. And then those patients in the control arm, if they still meet criteria, can cross over, as in Simplicity HTN2, um, and then are followed subsequently for the next three years uh, in this protocol. The patient is blinded along with the treating physician, so we have a team of our team of nephrology, hypertension specialists, as well as cardiologists who follow these patients in the office. We ask that no medication adjustments are made unless there's an AE, an adverse event, or symptom change that mandates it, such as uh, symptomatic hypotension. Um, a systolic blood pressure of less than 115 or a rise in blood pressure of greater than 15 millimeters mercury. These are the so-called escape criteria, and this technique is fairly standard, uh, as uh, Dr. Wright uh, had his hands in designing this trial. So this is how it's done in most of the hypertension literature. So for our trial here at University Hospitals, because we have one of the leading hypertension specialists in the world, we have an even more stringent criteria, uh, which is that we want four fully tolerated doses of antihypertensives antihypertensive drugs, including a diuretic and an aldosterone antagonist, such as spironolactone, as, as Dr. Wright uh, discussed previously, uh, and two other agents at max tolerated doses. Uh, they have to have an EGFR greater than uh, 45, um, and they have to meet all the other inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, after the six-month endpoint, patients can cross over at the expense of the sponsor, um, and in fact, all of the, the visits for the trial are paid for by the sponsor. So we'll uh, talk in, the, uh, in a few minutes about if you have any questions about the protocol, but we certainly would welcome your uh, referral of patients to us uh, for, for the trial as we're getting down to the fourth quarter, as it were. Uh, we want to get as many patients uh, an opportunity as possible to be in the trial. So one of the interesting things, scientifically speaking, about this technique is that there are a lot of off-target effects. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Wright alluded to is that insulin resistance is mediated by sympathetic uh, nerve activity. And in fact, in a sub-study of Simplicity HTN1, the first registry, um, 
the investigators looked at uh, about 50 patients of the 100 in that first registry um, who were treated with either denervation or control. Their mean age was 60, BMI 31. About 16% uh, had diabetes, which is about half of what we see in our coronary intervention laboratory. Uh, and 52% had impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance, uh, as strictly defined. Um, and so what they looked at was what happens to their glycemic control following renal denervation, the hypothesis being that there should be improvement in insulin uh, sensitivity. And in fact, uh, what they saw, um, you'll see in the yellow bars are the, the, those 37 patients who got renal denervation, and in the green, the control patients. And by virtually every metric, whether it was fasting glucose, fasting insulin, fasting C-peptide levels, or the home IR uh, assay, those patients with renal uh, denervation had improvement in their insulin sensitivity and glucose handling. Now, the metabolic reasons for this are, are certainly uh, subject to debate. Uh, but it's a real fascinating observation. If you look at uh, what happened to these patients, if those patients in orange are diabetics, those uh, in green are insulin, uh, I'm sorry, impaired glucose tolerance, or fasting glucose, and, and yellow is normal. And those patients uh, from left to right who underwent renal denervation had a significant improvement in their glucose tolerance and glycemic control as compared to control, which in fact trended to get worse uh, in this limited number of patients. So close to my heart is obviously the heart. Um, and looking at um, the patients who have a diastolic dysfunction is one of the most vexing problems we have in, in uh, heart failure today. It makes up about 50% of our patient population with heart failure, and they are notoriously difficult to treat. Many of them have either severe or resistant hypertension. And in those patients, one of the biggest things that we look for is diastolic function as measured by echocardiography. Uh, in, in these patients, the patients in red, uh, at time zero uh, and subsequently one to six months, have improved metrics of diastolic function on echocardiography compared to those in blue who are in control. And so it may well be that sympathetic denervation is in fact one of the few treatments where we see improvements in diastology based on echocardiography. And it, again, remains to be seen whether we'll see an improvement in clinical outcome with this. But it is a fascinating observation that in this small number of patients, they saw a statistically significant improvement in diastology. In addition, for those of us who are interested in physiology, one might uh, wonder if there's a normal adrenergic and chronotropic uh, response to exercise. And in fact, they've done another substudy in a different set of patients who received this therapy in Europe where if you look in the white bars, these are patients at baseline who undergo an exercise tolerance test. They have a normal rise in blood pressure. You see here, they start out in the 170s and rise to over 220. Uh, the, the, the aspect and slope of this curve is normal, however. Um, after denervation, not only is their blood pressure lower, they, ha they still have a normal rise in blood pressure. One might have expected that this would have been blended, which would potentially have led to exercise intolerance, uh, but there doesn't seem to be that finding in this small uh, cohort of patients. Similarly, chronotropic response, heart rate response, while resting heart rates have reduced at baseline, um, the heart rate response to exercise is normal through exercise and into recovery. So again, it's a therapy in which uh, the chronotropic and uh, blood pressure response is preserved with a uh, improvement in diastolic dysfunction. That would be a home run, potentially, in the management of these patients with diastolic heart failure. So Simplicity HF is a uh, hypertension uh, and heart failure trial. Dr. Fang um, is, in, is working with the Heart Failure Network here in the United States, led by Dr. Bronwald, to recapitulate this trial that's being done in Europe um, to better assess the role of renal denervation in patients with, with heart failure. I also want to mention for my nephrology colleagues that uh, even though patients with CKD that's uh, greater than stage 3 are excluded from the trial, uh, in Europe, of course, where this is available uh, on label, um, patients with CKD see similar reductions in blood pressure despite the fact uh, they wouldn't be enrolled in our trial here in the United States. And this is typically with GFRs that are in the 30 range. Uh, and you can see in, in the small cohort of 15 patients, the GFRs are preserved over time uh, in these subjects uh, after having uh, sympathetic denervation. So there is hope for our uh, resistant hypertensive patients 
uh, who have CKD or even worse renal failure, um, that this may help with uh, redu reducing blood pressure and eventually reducing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So obviously with this impressive data, um, there's been a ton of excitement. We as interventional cardiologists are, are impugned as being early adopters, and this is no uh, exception. There are roughly 60 companies worldwide working on this technology, um, and they fall into a, a variety of different buckets in terms of how they plan to do the denervation. The big players in the United States, Medtronic being the leader, Boston Scientific, St. Jude, Cordis, and Comedian, are worried, working on ablation catheter technologies, be it with a balloon catheter or a standard the EP ablation catheter. There's a company called Mercator that has this novel uh, balloon catheter that actually allows you to puncture the renal artery and deliver guanethidine perivascularly through the renal artery. Doesn't sound like a good idea, but there are human data that support its use and safety, more importantly. Um, ultrasonic therapy using the intravascular ultrasound catheter, uh, which will allow you to focus the sound waves more uh, capably than an external ultrasound is being investigated. We already know about carotid barrier receptor uh, antagonism, which has uh, been performed here as a clinical trial. And there's a lot of people who have resurrected the use of brachytherapy, which we used to use for restenosis in the coronary circulation. Uh, it's back uh, for this application. Um, although I think uh, all the big players are going with uh, an ablation technique, which I think is likely to be in the future for this technology here in the United States, at least for the foreseeable future. So to summarize briefly, um, the evolution of renal degeneration started with uh, uh, Dr. Smithwick uh, with a surgical sympathectomy and others of that era where there was more morbidity and mortality than there was efficacy. Today, the efficacy seems to be around about 80% in terms of reduction of systolic blood pressure uh, with a very low morbidity and mortality uh, we expect. And so we, we look forward to seeing what the data show us in the future uh, with simplicity HCN3 and 4 that is likely to follow, uh, as well as other trials coming in the future. There are a number of unanswered questions, which I hope will open up our discussion period. Uh, and I'd really like to get Dr. Wright's input on these. Uh, the question is, is, will there be sustained benefit? We expect that, like all peripheral nerves, there should be re of the renal arteries. We've seen three-year data so far showing sustained benefit. How long will it last? is anyone's guess. Um, when will there be an outcomes trial? As you know, uh, in cardiology, we're used to doing trials of 20,000 patients to show a 1% improvement in absolute risk reduction. And that's mandated now by our FDA. Um, we don't yet have that in this technology, although in Europe they're going wild with this technology, for better or worse. Um, so we need to have the outcomes data, I think, before we can really soundly embrace uh, the technology as a uh, part of our armamentarium. Uh, Long-term safety remains a question. I think, you know, it gives me pause to see uh, patients developing renal restenosis, as it were, uh, after this procedure. We have to see what happens. So far, we haven't seen any significant safety uh, endpoints here in the United States, but I imagine there will be some events uh, as time goes on. Um, we want to see what happens with not the resistant, but the severe hypertensive patient, the more garden variety patient that we see. We've screened hundreds of patients to enroll a handful here at UH, and that's been the experience nationally for Simplicity HTM3. The patients we see in the office are typically less hypertensive and more easily controlled when compliant. Uh, maybe this therapy would be a good opportunity for them. The jury is out on that. Um, the other question for those of us that particularly in South Asia where diabetes is, is, is even more prevalent than here in the United States, will renal denervation be therapy for diabetes, more so than hypertension and, and heart failure? Uh, those questions are out there and studies are ongoing to investigate that hypothesis, but one can imagine that there will be a much bigger market for this technology if that is in fact the case. Uh, and finally, how much does it all cost? Uh, in an era where we're uh, further and further curtailed from using advanced technologies to treat our patients, the cost is going to be a big factor, and the short answer is for this type of technology, nobody really knows. Um, is it uh, the same calculus that we use for dialysis? Is it something different? We just don't know, and the cost-effective analyses are still ongoing. So with that, I want to thank all of the people here at UH who are part of our team for Simplicity HTM3. It's a huge team, uh, and I appreciate everybody's hard work. We want your patients, uh, patients who are severe or resistant hypertensives, who are on free drugs or more, we'll take them. Uh, so please feel free to contact me or Terry Semenik, uh, who's our research coordinator for the trial, obviously Dr. Ryder and any other investigators also. Uh, but we want your patients for the trial. We need to figure out if this technique is something that's going to be here for a long time 
and will be a game changer for our patients. So with that, I thank you for your kind attention, and hopefully we have some time for questions. Uh, Dr. Wright, Dr. Uh, Farik, uh, let me uh, just begin by asking, are there any uh, common characteristics of the 15 to 20 percent of patients who are not amenable to the technique, who don't respond? Do we, do we know anything about that? Uh, who don't respond? Do, yeah, the, you, you, about 15 percent of patients who undergo the procedure don't get a blood pressure reduction. Is there anything? It's too soon, I think, uh -huh. now. Uh, uh, so obviously, uh, uh, as, as there's longer follow-up, then uh, we shall see. Uh, in fact, uh, as uh, 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 Dr. Parikh uh, mentioned, that uh, some of those patients are actually beginning to uh, uh, actually show improvement. And of the ones who were initially uh, of the ones who initially were resistant. So, so I wonder if it was a failed you know, a technical yeah. issue yeah. or something yeah. pathophysiologic. Yeah, as, as a proceduralist, yeah. we always blame the procedure. Yeah, yeah. So we think that we did an incomplete job, but the pathophysiology remains unclear. Right. Um, other uh, questions, Dr. Armitage? Yeah, you know, um, we're most likely to encounter patients who get admitted to the hospital. Do we call you or your parents? Yeah. Call me. Pay for it, call me, uh, email me. Uh, we, uh, we welcome those patients. There are obviously, I didn't go through all the laundry list of exclusions. Patients who had a hypertensive or urgency or emergency have a sort of a moratorium period after which uh, you know, they have to get through before we can enroll them in the trial. Uh, but certainly those patients, we want to collect those patients. And the truth is, is that whether it's this technology or the next technology, this series of trials is going to be here for the next five years. Yeah. And these patients, we're going to be figuring this out for the, the better part of the next decade, I suspect. Just want to, excuse me, I just want to remind everyone that all of our grand rounds, including this one, are on the departmental website, so you'll be able to get the contact information uh, there as, uh, as, as well. Lance? Yeah. If you I believe all the sympathetic nerves today, how come it takes a whole year before the blood pressure problems out? Well, I, I think the data show that in, in some patients you see a response as, as quickly as a month. Other patients, it's six to 12 months. Uh, I think my time is up. Uh, the, uh, but the why it takes so long remains unclear. And now we're seeing patients respond out to two years. The, the, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, I think Jackson might have a better insight than me. I don't. <laughs> On that note, uh, let's uh, adjourn, and I'm sure they'll be uh, willing to take a few questions between us. Uh